I have the incredible privilege of introducing a very special friend in my life. His name is Charles Lowry. I've known Charles for, uh, well, at least several decades, let me just put it that way. And I've known him and watched him as one of the most creative communicators that I have ever known. He is a psychologist by training, not a pastor, but he has served as an, a pastor and has served in some amazing ministries and built a wonderful church in years gone by. Uh, he speaks all over the nation, over 100,000 people a year uh, in these days. And God has just given him a gift that all I can say is unique. And you'll know that once you've met him, once you've heard him. He and his wife, Penny, uh, have three daughters, and uh, that's another part of life and story. Ten grandchildren, and so he has a lot of relationships in his life. And uh, he is uh, one of the best and sharpest minds and provides some of the greatest insights ever on relationships. And so I want you today to help me to welcome to Warren Dr. Charles Lowry. Well, thank you, and I am a psychologist by training, so I've met a lot of interesting people. Nine o'clock appointment, never forget the guy. Came in, sat down, I say, what psychologists say? I said, uh, how can I help you? He says, you can't help me, I'm crazy. I said, oh, uh, how do you know that? He said, I've been a psychiatrist. He said, I'm crazy. I said, well, uh, what is he telling you to do? You know, if you ever wanna be a psychologist and make money at it, here's some advice. Find out what people are doing right now and don't advise that, okay? Because it's not working or they wouldn't be seeing you. You understand? Uh, so find out what they're doing and tell them to do something else, right? So I was going to find out, well, what's he telling you to do? He said, not do anything. I'm crazy. I can't be helped. So he started telling me his story and he, you know, he had a pretty good story. Stories go, but I've heard every story that ever existed. And so, uh, but I'm, I'm trying to maintain eye contact, leaning forward, doing what psychologists do, saying, uh-huh, uh-huh. I can understand how you feel that way. Uh-huh. I mean, I thought I was doing pretty good. About 20 minutes into it, he gets up and starts to walk out, you know, and he looked at me and says, I'm leaving. You're totally incompetent. You don't know what you're doing. I'm not wasting any more of my time. And he starts to leave, you know, he just walked. I said, whoa, wait, wait a minute. You call me incompetent. You know, you got kind of hollering at me a little bit here. I said, why don't you tell me why? He said, it'd been obvious to anybody, much less a so-called trained observer of human behavior that I had on two watches. They're identical watches. I bought them the same time, same place, never been over a second apart. I raised that arm so you can see that watch. I raised that arm so you can see that watch. But you never noticed. You never brought it up. You never pointed it out. I'm leaving. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, before you go, could you just do one thing for me? He said, what? I take notes when people talk. I hand him my notepad. I said, I want you to read what's on this notepad in big bold letters right at the top here read it so i hand him my notepad he looks at it he starts to smile i said no read it out loud he read these words this man has owned two watches <laughs> he said you noticed didn't you i said not only did i notice I know why you wear two watches. Man, he got excited. His eyes started to get big. He started to talk really fast. Whoa, 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 why do I wear two watches? I said, because you're crazy. You told me that when you first came in here. <laughs> he sat down. We had a nice little chat. And I actually told him that to get his attention. And man, I told you that to get your attention, all right? We're going to talk today about you and your Adams family. We all came from the Adams family. Remember Uncle Adam? Remember Uncle Ain't Eve? We all came from the Adams family, and it makes life very difficult. So I want to read to you what happened. Scripture, Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. And he said that I heard the sound. This is Adam talking. This is uh, Uncle Adam. The sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid your basic emotion, the, the emotion that, that keeps you from living the life that God wants you to have is fear. I was afraid. And you make a decision every day of your life whether you're going to live by fear or whether you're going to live by faith. Uh, I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? And have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, to, well, the woman whom you gave me, she's the one. You know, uh, She gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. So then the Lord said to the woman, 
What is this that you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me. The word deceived is also the word that's going to keep you from living the life God created because the world will deceive you just like it deceived Eve. And she ate. So how do we live the kind of life that God had in mind when he created us? It's difficult. So I'm going to use the word down, D-O-W-N. Because because of your Adam suit, you're going to do some dumb things, right? Now, your Adam suit is what you go around in, okay? It's not you, but it what carries you around, all right? Now, your Adam suit will never totally be redeemed. God's got to kill it to get you into heaven. You understand that. But the more you can redeem it, the better life you're going to have down here. Now, that has nothing to do with you get to heaven or not. But down here, the more you can redeem it, the better off you are. Uh, uh, we had a cowboy coach. I told the men uh, this weekend, I'm a cowboy fan. They're going to be pallbearers at my funeral so they can let me down one last time. You know, I'm a, I'm a cowboy fan. And we had this coach named Tom Landry. And here's what Tom Landry said. My job is to make guys do what they do not want to do in order to accomplish what they've dreamed of doing all their lives. Now, that's just not the job of a coach. That's the job of a parent. That's the job of a pastor. Matter of fact, that's your job. Your job is to make your Adam suit do what it does not want to do in order to accomplish what you've dreamed of doing all your life. And that's a lifelong battle. Why? Because of, because of sin, because it came into the world, you have a struggle with this Adam suit. It does not want to act better. It wants to feel better. It does not want to plan. It wants a pill. It does not want education. It wants medication. It doesn't want to do goal achieving things. It wants to do tension reducing things. That's your Adam suit. That's my Adam suit. You say, well, now, wait a minute. We're the, we're, we're the good crowd. We're the, we're the guys came early. We're the, we're the really, man, we're, we're. it doesn't matter. <laughs> Apostle Paul, probably the greatest Christian to ever live, Apostle Paul. You know what he said about his Adam suit? Things I don't want to do, I do. And the things I really want to do, I can't seem to do. That's not a teenager. That's the greatest Christian that ever lived. <laughs> so what does that mean for you? <laughs> I'll tell you what that means. You're in deep trouble. That's what that means. That means every day of your life, you've got to get this Adam suit to do what it does not want to do. So you, but you're going to do some dumb things, you know, best, best you can do, still not going to measure up. And not only that, O stands for other people. Other people got the same Adam suit you got. So if you're counting on them not to mess up, you're in deep trouble too. Why? Because they, they're going to do the things they don't want to do. So, and then W stands for world. Then we add a world that's a Ponzi scheme that's always deceiving you. You see, the world says this, you can have this without that you know you can have this without that and you can for a while but unfortunately the that shows up and by the time the that shows up you're usually addicted to the this you see i i'll describe it this way uh i'm uh, i'm in airports a lot because i i need to you know fly and my arms get tired so i, I try to get some airplanes and so uh, i'm in airports late at night and there's usually some team there, uh, a team of, uh, of males about 17 years of age. You know? And if you're ever around males about 17 years of age, uh, their IQs like plant life pretty much. Uh, I mean, you hear 17-year-old males talk and you think, can an IQ test come back negative? I mean, uh, they, <laughs> 17 year old males say stuff like this. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm joining the Marines. You know, that, that's what 17-year-old boys say. You know, uh, that, that, that's the way they think. You know? And so they're in the airport, and it's late at night. And you ever seen these airports that have these people movers? You know, they, they go, they, those people move. I love them because it's like a horizontal escalator, and it's moving. And you can move because it's moving and you're moving. I mean, man, it is making progress, man. And I, I love those people movers, man, making progress. Uh, now, these boys, they're in the airport late at night, they some team, and they decide to go down the people mover the wrong way. Why? Because they can. And they're young. And they're quick. 
and they're going to do what they tell them you cannot do. And they decide to go down the people mover the wrong way. And they can. I mean, they're young and they they get away with it. And, you know, they got to work at it. They got to work at it. And they do it. They they get to the end. These things are long. They're a little tired to get to the end. They start high-fiving each other. You know, we did it. We went the wrong way, laughing. And they don't realize they're still on the people mover. (laughs) Takes them all the way back to where they started. I can't tell you how many hundreds, maybe thousands of people that I've worked with. And they think they can do it their way. They think they can control their Adam suit. They think if they want to do it, they're going to do it. And they can get away with it for a while. But then you're one of those people, five years later, 10 years later, they've lost their their job or their family or their children won't speak to them or they're addicted to something that's out of control in their life. And they're right back where they started. See, the world's a Ponzi scheme. The world will deceive you. See, see, if things happen immediately, I wouldn't have to go around the country telling people how to live if it happened immediately. I mean, you'd figure it out. It would be hard to deceive you if things happen immediately. I, uh, uh, my wife and I were in Mobile, Alabama. I was uh, uh, going to speak to a group the next day, and it was just getting dark, and I was just about to close the curtain. You know, that, you know the big curtains on those hotels. I was just about to close that curtain when the hot light on the Krispy Kreme came on, you know, just like, like boom, you know, like a sign from God, you know? Uh, uh, so I told my wife, look, honey, it's a sign from God, hot light, Krispy Kreme. Let's get some exercise and walk down to the Krispy Kreme. Now, I'm gonna teach you a word, and the word is rationalize, but it really means rational lies. It's lies you tell yourself to get what you want, you see. And your memory Adam suit just wants to feel good. So, so you, you, you convince yourself to do that, you know. And you always talk to yourself. The, you know, your internal conversation, is the most, you know, that's the most important conversation you have. And, and see, the world's a Ponzi scheme. The world says things like, follow your heart. You can't follow your heart. I'd weigh 300 pounds if I followed my heart. You can't follow your heart. You gotta, you gotta guard your heart. It's what the Bible says. You gotta lead your heart. You, you can't listen to yourself. You gotta talk to yourself. See, you listen to yourself. Yourself will say, "Man, those Krispy Kreme gonna be good. You need to get, you need to go down and get one of those." You know, and and so get some exercise, rational eye, walk down the Krispy Kreme. When we get to the Krispy Kreme, guess what? Cheaper by the dozen. Let's save money and get 12. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's rational lie. It's, it's good to save money. That's a great virtue. Let's save money, get 12. And that's when I realized I could eat eight Krispy Kreme donuts by myself. I mean, it's just hot fried sugar, right? I mean, just melts in your mouth. And no consequences. Hey, no immediate consequences. Just pure pleasure, pure pleasure. Didn't have to change pants, get another belt. Just pure pleasure. And that's the way the world is. The world gives you a lot of pure pleasure. No immediate consequences. I wished it had immediate consequences. If you took a bite of Krispy Kreme and fat went, bloop, you'd go, good night. Did you see that fat jump out of that donut? That is a powerful donut. I, 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 I've never seen fat jump out like that. I'm not, I don't even want to get close to those donuts. <laughs> That's not the way it works, is it? At first you have it, then it has you. I told the men this weekend, like a dog returns to its vomit. You don't even want to do it, and you do it, you see, because those habits start to control you. Matter of fact, it, it's a lot like a dog, you know, that you've got to learn to control. You ever been to somebody's house where the dog control the house? I mean, you're on the porch and the dog is licking you and getting on your leg and you're trying to get the dog away from me and you're ringing the doorbell trying to get away from this dog. And finally they come to the door and you think, man, I'm away from this dog. And they let the dog come in with you. you know? and, and, and you're trying to eat and the dog's trying to get your food and you're trying to keep the dog down and eat at the same time. And then they always say this. Is the dog bothering you? 
I would like to say, is this a C&I dog? Because evidently you're totally blind. You know, uh, <laughs> yes, the dog is bothering me. You know, and then they say something. Like, well, that's how the dog shows affection. It's miserable. Don't invite me to your house. You got a dog you don't control. You know, miserable. But I've been to people's houses. They control the dog. They tell it when to sit. They tell it when to get. And it's a pretty reasonable existence, you see. But the world's a Ponzi scheme. It's always lying to you. And it, all, and it, or it says things like this. Life's like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Yeah. That's a lie. You know? You know what the Bible says? Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. I, t- I promise you, you pretty much tell me what you're doing, I'm pretty much going to tell you how it's going to turn out. <laughs> I'll tell you how it's going to turn out. See? There's certain principles that God set up the way the world works. You know? And it doesn't matter if you know those principles or, not, or if you deny those. I mean, you jump out of a 50-story building, it's called the law of gravity. I mean, you can say, you know, about floor 25 on the way down, so far so good. But at the end, it ain't going to, it ain't going to work out too good, you see. Uh, because that's the way the world's set up. What's your, see, life is like a box of chocolate if it's like a Whitman sampler. Remember, remember Whitman samplers? You could look on the box and it would tell you what's inside. If you wanted fudge and peanuts, third from the right, bingo, you got it. You know? uh, now, the Whitman sampler was a lot like life. Why? Because it would wrap up a few things. You know, there's going to be some prizes in your life. You're going to reap and sow, and sometimes you're going to work hard, and a hailstorm is going to wipe out the whole crop. That that's, that's happens in life. It's a fallen world. That's why God's created create a new heaven and a new earth, by the way, because this world's it's going to be like that. You're going to have some of those things, too. But pretty much, you tell me what you're doing with a few surprises. I'm going to tell you how it's going to turn out. It's the way the world is. Now, N, D-O-W-N, stands for negative. Now, because we come from Adam and Eve... You want what you do not have. See, the world is always telling you, you're not happy now, but if you can get this, you'd be happy. You know, that, that, that'd make you happy. See? And Adam and Eve, remember, they had everything. They had everything. But what did, what did they want? The one thing they didn't have. You know? And that's in you, and that's in me. You see, we, we always want what we don't have. You know, we, oh, we can just get that, I'd be happy. And that's how the world keeps you miserable. I always think if I could just get that, I'd be happy. I'm a, I'm a dad, but when our relationships conference, we talk about my family. Uh, we talked about three girls. I, I have three daughters, and so we lived in the city most of our life, and they had always wanted a dog. And so being the dad, we'd have to get a dog. And uh, uh, people say, when does life really begin? I'll tell you when life really begins. It's when the kids leave home and the dog dies. But uh, I... Uh, uh, I'd have to get these dogs. And I don't anybody ever had a city dog? City, city dog spends its entire life trying to get out of the fence in the backyard. That's what they do. They, they, and so if you're the daddy, you got to try to get that fence high enough so that dog can't get over it. You got to get it low enough so it can't get through it, you know. And then the gate, you got to get it tight enough because he'll try to squeeze through the gate and he'll try to get out. And your whole life is trying, how do I keep that dog in that fence? Because that dog every day is trying to figure out, how do I get out of this fence? How do I get in the fence, you know? And then you got it fortified. I mean, you got the dog in the fence and you got him and you think, you know, I've got him and i got that dog. And the dog waits for the back door and the front door of the house to open at the same time. And it shoots through the house and runs out in the neighborhood. And you got to go chase the dog down again and go put it back in that fence again. And the whole thing starts all over. It's a miserable existence being the daddy of a city dog. We moved to the country. The country, dogs sit on porches. There's no fence. They just sit there. Why? Because they're content. They know what they have here is a lot better than that fantasy out there. Life's pretty simple. Learn to be a country dog instead of a city dog, you see. Learn to appreciate what you have because the world is always trying to tell you that's what's going to make you happy. Just get that. Just do that. So how do we find the right path? And 
uh, I told the men, I've never actually finished a message in my life, so we won't finish that. But uh, uh, that's why people have to invite me back, because I don't have a real job. I have to come back. So, uh, P-A-T-H is what we're going to try to do, the right path. And the first thing is your perspective. That's why the Bible always talks about renewing your mind, because the brain can only think of one thought at a time. You're going to have this thought, or you're going to have that thought. And so you have to constantly renew your mind because by living in this world and having your Adam suit, your mind starts to drift and you start thinking the way the world wants you to think and you end up having a miserable life. Uh, it's easy to drift. I, uh, I love to, to jump in the ocean. I'm, uh, my next event, I'm speaking in Florida and I'll probably jump in the ocean. I just, it's just something feels good about it, you know, jumping in the ocean. You know, people say, what about sharks? Well, if you hear the music, get out of the water, you know. Uh, <laughs> but otherwise, just enjoy it, right? And so uh, I, I, uh, I remember the first time I got to be in the ocean by myself. Well, a friend of mine, he's about 10, I'm about 10, and our parents let us go out in the ocean. So we were out there riding the waves, and, you know, we thought we are big stuff, man, we are big stuff. And, the, you know, the parents are on the beach with their umbrellas and stuff, and we're out there about 30, 40 minutes and then we look for our parents, and they're gone. I mean, our parents have left us, our own parents. You know, they're gone, you know. Uh, and, then, and then my buddy said, look, way down there. And my parents have picked up the umbrellas <laughs> and the towels, and they've moved a half a mile down the beach. Now, why would they do that? You know? And then we look at the hotel we're staying in, and the hotel has moved a half a mile down the beach. <laughs> And then being smart guys, we realize uh, hotels can't move. <laughs> we moved and we didn't even realize it, you see. So it's a constant change in your mind, renewing your mind, because see, you, your Adam suit always thinks about the negative from the time you're little to the time you're old. You know, if you're old, you just do dumber things slower, you know, but you still do them. Uh, uh, so uh, my, my daughter, Brianne, she was about, uh, she was about, eight, I guess, maybe seven, somewhere around there, maybe even six, I don't know. Uh, Going to teach you how to ride a bicycle. Fall of the year, not a car in the parking lot. I took her this big water park, I mean, asphalt everywhere, biggest parking lot you've ever seen. I said, look at this asphalt, man, you're going to be a bike rider. I had to learn to ride on sand and rocks, but you, you're going to go fast on this asphalt. Going to feel the wind to get your face. Man, you're going to be a bike rider. She's excited. I was excited. Got that bike out. Look at all that asphalt. Said, Daddy, what's, way, what's that way down there? I said, don't worry about that. Look at this asphalt. Well, Daddy, that's a pole. Well, don't worry about the pole. Look at all this asphalt. Well, what if I hit the pole? You're not going to hit the pole, Brian. Look at all this asphalt. Well, if I hit the pole, it's going to hurt. It's not going to hurt because you're not going to pole. Now, get on a bicycle. You know how to teach a kid how to ride a bike, don't you? Run like crazy, feel the wind to get your face. You're a bike rider. What if I hit that pole? You're not going to hit the pole, Brian. Go. And she heads straight for the pole. <laughs> Daddy, I'm headed for the pole. I said, turn it to the right. Look at all that asphalt. Turn it to the right. I can't turn it to the right. I'm headed for the pole. I said, turn it to the left. Look at all. Turn it. I can't turn it. I'm headed for the pole. She mutilates that pole. By the time I got there, lips stuck out, tears in her eyes. I told you I was going to hit the pole. I said, I know, Brianne, because you focused on the pole. Let me tell you why most of you are miserable, stressed out, depressed. You're pole hitters. Comes from the Adams family. You focus on the pole. You talk about the pole. And the problem is, there's poles out there. It's a it's, it's fallen world. There's something wrong with everything. There's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with you. Something wrong with your pastor. Something wrong with your car. You don't know it yet. There's something wrong with everything. You know? Just go out there. I mean, lane you're in slows down. The reason it slows down because you're in it. Switch lanes, you just slow down the other lane. You ever notice that? You know? uh, the mate that snores goes to sleep first. That's just life. The barcode never works on the most embarrassing item. I, I know that. I, I raised three girls. Uh, my wife used to hand me that list, and I'm thinking, I'm not buying that. She said, yes, you are. You're the daddy. you buying that. I said, no, I'm, yes, you are. I'm buying that. I'm the daddy, but I don't want anybody to see. You know, I'm, I'm sneaking out. Price check. They wave it. I'm saying, put it down. I'll pay anything. Get me out of here. 
Poles. You got a pole in your family, I guarantee you, don't you? Every family tree has a sap. You got a pole in your family. Instead of enjoying Christmas dinner, what did you do? I know what you did. You talked about the pole. What if the pole comes? What if the pole doesn't come? What if the pole comes drunk like last year? What if the pole brings her that other pole? What are we going to do? And life becomes miserable. And it's all, by the way, it's always been that way. It always will be that way. Until God creates a new heaven and new earth, that's the way it's going to be. What it's always been. Remember the, remember the first church relocation committee? They had a chance to go to the promised land. I mean, how good is that? The promised land. <laughs> not good enough. Ten came back, not with grapes, with gripes. Not going to the promised land. Poles. Big poles. Giants. Not going. God said, you got the promised land here, buddy. Whoa, we're not going. Two came back with grapes. Look how big these grapes are. What God said is true. See? They lived a life of faith. Look, what God said is true. Oh, no. That's proof, all right. Remember, it's not the facts. It's what you focus on. Oh, those are big, all right. That's proof. Only big giants could grow big grapes like that. We're not going. And they didn't go. The people of God who had a chance to live a life in the promised land decided to live a life in pitiful land griping and complaining i hope the percentage is not the same today but it probably is most of god's people do not live in the promised land that he wants them to stay in they live in pitiful land griping and complaining and focusing on it. You see, everything in life has got problems. Your marriage has problems. I used to do marriage counseling. Even even marriages that have problems, it's just 15% problems. It's 85% positive, but it's that 15% negative. But that's what you focus on. That's what you talk about. And it makes you miserable. Matter of fact, grandma and grandpa, they took their grandkids on vacation, turned on the interstate, saw this big sign, Natural Park. They thought, oh, that'd be good for the grandkids, nature trails, things like that. They pull in and realize this really is a natural park. Let's be uh, politically correct here. Clothing optional lifestyle, okay? Uh, some of you may know it as a nudist camp, okay? Well, this is Georgia. For you bubbas, I'm talking naked people, okay? Naked people. <laughs> They, they pull in and realize, oh, no, this is a nudist. The grandkids are in the back. They're trying to get their hands up so the kids can't see. Of course, you know kids. They're already jumping up. Look at those people. Look at them. There's four people coming on bicycles right at them, not a stitch, just coming right at them. Look at those people on those bicycles. Look at them. Look at them. Look at them. They don't have. Look at them. They don't have. They don't, they don't, look at them. They don't have, they don't have their safety helmets on. How could they focus on that? Because that's what God allowed them to focus on. Why? Because they were taught that all their lives. You see, it's a discipline to focus on what God wants you to focus on, but that's going to give you the life and the promised land that he provided for you. It's all a matter of renewing your mind and thinking God's way. You say, well, how can you focus when things are so bad on something good? Because see, if you can see the God in the situation, eventually there'll be the good in the situation. Told the men this weekend, the cross is the biggest plus sign in your life. The cross says that whatever the world could do to you, the worst thing they could do to somebody became the best thing for everybody because of Jesus Christ. The worst thing the world can do to you can become the best thing for you because of the power of Jesus Christ. What the world wants to destroy you with, God will use and develop you with. It's whether you rely on his faith or whether you take the fear of the world and start looking at all the things the world can do to you instead of what God can do for you. That's your perspective. Now, A stands for be authentic. T stands for tell yourself the truth. But H, we've got to wrap this up. So H is where we want to end. 
H means you have to have a partner. You have to have a partner. You can't do this thing called life by yourself. My wife's a cultured lady. She likes the world of ballet. I don't, I don't get the world of ballet. I, I told her if they had taller men and women, they wouldn't have to stand on their tiptoes. I just don't understand ballet. But I did read a story out of the world of ballet. The New York City Ballet, somebody gave them a gazillion dollars if they would bring Barishnikov to New York City to dance in the ballet. And they, he agreed. I mean, if you give him a gazillion dollars, I guess he would. Barishnikov agreed to come to New York City and dance in the local ballet. But he said, I'm, I'm not going to dance an individual recital. I'm going to select somebody from this local uh, group, and I'm going to work with them for two weeks, and then we're going to dance a recital together. So he picked this gal named Gelby Kirkland. The guy writing the article said, I thought it was the worst choice he could have made. I've been watching this lady for years. She's not even average, I don't think. I believe she's a little uh, uh, below average. She has no strong dance moves. She, she, she lacks confidence. She, she doesn't even have much of a personality, it doesn't seem like, and she definitely doesn't have what we'd call charisma. I thought that was a bad choice. But two weeks later, I'm on the front row because that's my job to review these things. And well, they came out on the stage. And I looked and I thought, that's not her. He must have heard my advice. He picked somebody else. And I looked on the program. There's the name, Gailby Kirkland. I looked back up and it's her. It just didn't look like her. She looked so different. And then they started to dance. I couldn't believe it. I, this lady, she had moves I've, I've never seen. It's like she developed confidence, uh, some kind of personality. She even what we'd call have charisma. And then the sentence is what got my attention, the very last one. Here's what he said. I was blown away by the transformation that occurred in this lady's personality when she partnered with the master. You're Adam suit. You don't have a chance unless you partner with the master. Jesus came into this world to live a life you could never live. You'll never be able to get your Adam suit to do what you want it to do all the time. He lived that life. And he died that death because he wanted you and his forever family. He not only wants to partner with you right now, he wants you to live with him forever. And once you partner with the master, there will be a transformation that occurs. And you will have the possibility of living the life that God had in mind when he created you. And it will be like living in his promised land. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together. Lord, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. It's a time for people to come forward, maybe to talk to somebody, maybe just to kneel. Give someone the faith to believe, not in a religion or being good or all that stuff we've added on, but they would believe that Jesus loved them enough to live that life that they'll never be able to live and to die and conquer death so that they could be in his forever family. All he ever wanted was a family and help them to understand he wants them in his family. Others, Lord, well, they've partnered with you, but wow, they just somehow slipped into pitiful land. They're not renewing their mind and, and they're not able to get their Adam suit to do great things that you had in mind when you created them. Give them the courage to live by faith and not by fear. Maybe just to come and kneel and say, God, I forgot who my partner was. <laughs> and we're going to start right now doing great things. Whatever you put on people's heart, give them the courage to come. Nobody ever regrets coming here and kneeling or talking to you.
Thank you for what you're going to do through your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.